Great. Well, I'll welcome everybody. We'll go ahead and get started. It's uh, almost six after, so um, Becky Tipton, if you'd I'm like here. to take it away. Thanks, Thank Robert. You. Good to see everybody tonight. Molly, that's a good question. It's one that's been raised on Facebook quite often, and it's one that's perplexing to new beekeepers. Do check to make sure that there aren't bees getting under, into your syrup reserves, like under the lid, that they're, um, you're going to have to go into your hive and make sure that there isn't some robbing going on or there isn't anything else because that really is an unusual amount of syrup being used. I would be, well, I would quart, be questioning that. Yeah, a, a quart a day would be almost two gallons in a week, wouldn't it? Four quarts to a gallon? They would, that's true. Yeah. And, but in all honesty, I don't see many hives taking a quart a day for more than a few days. So now if you're next week, then they really slacked off and you kind of go, oh, okay, well then they were really low on feed. <laughs> They've fed up and now they've kind of got things back under control. I think that would be normal, but I don't think they will sustain that for more than a week, something like that. But but they can take an amazing amount of syrup if they're really hungry. So that's that's kind of concerning. We had another question right off the bat in um, that is Josh is asking in our chat box, and that's a way to post a question. If you have one tonight and you don't want to unmute yourself and just speak up, type it in the chat box. It's available on my computer. It's at the bottom of the screen. Uh, he says, "How do we know if we should be feeding?" And uh, Steve Musburger mentioned the HEF test. And you go to the back of your hive and you just reach down and grab the handle and kind of that along the bottom and pull up, click clear down to the bottom and pull up. If it kind of goes hoo 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 and you can do that really easy, those bees are hungry. And if you can't hardly move it, then it's probably got quite a bit of food in there. That's one way, but honestly, you still have to get in until you really know what's going on, know what's going on in your hive. So, uh, so it's Lincoln, just better to, better to be safe and feed a little bit and uh, they'll eat what they, what they can and fill up the second deep super. That's exactly right. And okay. um, I, when we, the buzzer comes out next week, I wrote about feeding in the fall. And one of the things in the spring we're cautioned frequently, don't overfeed your bees it'll encourage them to swarm. You'll have bees hanging in the trees. It'll be a mess for you. But in the fall, that isn't the case. They're not going to swarm on you. If they don't want food, they just flat out won't take it. And it'll just sit there and kind of, hmm, oh, okay, they didn't want it. They, as the queen quits laying, they, they shrink her brood area. They'll backfill that with that nectar. It's good to have it for them. If they need it, they will take it. If they don't need it, they won't take it. So we almost always offer food in the fall to our hives just as a precaution. I don't know, anybody else want to chime in on that one about how do you know when you should be feeding or if you should be feeding? I just want to reiterate, like you said, you just got to pull out the frames and look if that top hive body is full of, full of honey, you don't have to feed if you got a lot of room or or especially if you pulled frames out that you extracted from down below mm -hmm. you need to feed 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 so that they've got food to make it through the winter thank you very good travis wants to know the difference between robber bees and your bees is cheryl on here tonight cheryl burkhead why do you ask me that question i don't know <laughs> I just felt like you would be somebody that would, would want to talk about that. Um, I just look at the behavior yeah. on the hive. And if they're trying to get in every crevice around the box, not just at the entrance, but they'll try to go around every seam, um, then you've got robbing going on. Sometimes a lot of beginners have trouble deciphering that from just afternoon, late afternoon orientation flights um, that uh, usually happen sometime between three and five o'clock where there's a whole bunch of activity. 
if they're if they're not fighting at the entrance and spinning around and on the ground in in battle and they're just doing f nice figure eights uh, out uh, away from the front of the hive, then they're probably just orientation flights. But the, the dead giveaway is when you've got bees clustered at every seam around the entire box, even on the back side and around the lid. I haven't had any of that this year. I had one experience with it a, a year or two ago when I came home and found it, so. And I just put the hose on them. <laughs> And By that time, it might be too late. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's also yeah, getting close to the time to yeah, put you know, your, your entrance reducers on. That, yeah. help, that helps a lot. I had entrance reducers on when mine started that. And trying to keep your colonies about the same strength would help probably too. But I ended up putting robbing screens on all the, uh, the warring parties and that seemed to stop it, and I didn't lose any hives over it, but, you know, if you don't catch it soon enough, they can pretty much decimate a hive in a day or so. This time of year, most people seem to think that it's, honestly, it's a lot easier to prevent robbing than it is to end robbing. Uh, if things that you want to avoid, anything that's going to start a robbing situation, don't leave um, honey frames set out, or if you break open some honey frames, don't leave that exposed. Don't leave the hive exposed for very long. So that when you're, if you're doing an inspection, make it fast, get in, get out. Um, if Steve believes, I don't know whether this is true or not, this is pretty unscientific, it's a Steve Tipton, that if he's feeding every hive in the yard, that they are less likely to begin that robbing activity. He thinks that having food on the hive kind of makes them feel like I want to guard my own hive and that they aren't as likely then to go out. And I think that's contrasted by if you are just feeding your weak hives, that really kind of sets them up for a robbing activity, that they are then going to go, oh, they know that there's food in there and that they will go. So, um, very good. All right. Well, we got a few questions for tonight. Let's see if we can get to some of those questions. And um, the first one was asked by Brian from Central Kansas, but it's been asked and actually by several people, what is the quickest, safest, and easiest way to transport bees I need to take them roughly two hours to our new house. Now, these not just going to move across the yard. He's got a long-term move, and there are some different things to consider. Jolie, you said you've talked about some people with that question. You want to field that one? We want to. Well, why don't you move closer? We can't see Cecil's happy little face. Well, he doesn't want you to, and he doesn't want you to know that he's talking to me, telling me what to say. So, <laughs> anyway, we think that if you have the option of using a trailer, because it's a little lower to lift it up on, that that's the easiest. If not, you would want to at least use a pickup and not try and move them in your sedan. But the other thing we really believe in is using ratchet straps. We ratchet strap really, really good. Um, ideally, you want to um, have all your protective equipment on and anyone helping you, you want them to have your protective equipment on. And Miles Raymond is on here. And we tell this story about you every time we talk about moving bees, Miles. He one time had someone help him move bees and they didn't, they had the not, he had the best protective equipment on. And whoever was helping him did not have the best protective equipment on. So if you have someone helping you who is not a beekeeper, really make sure they're dressed up because when it's nighttime, bees crawl and they sting and it is like not a very pleasant experience. Your smoker is also your friend. You want to make sure that um, you get your smoker going really good, that you smoke your bees really good to get them inside. And then if you have a moving screen or um, 
We typically leave ours open because we always move on a trailer, but a lot of people feel more comfortable either putting a piece of foam rubber in the entrance or staple a screen in or something like that. But you do want to do something to um, keep the bees inside. And then the other thing you want to do is when you get to your location, you want to make sure and have your area all set up. So if you're putting them on pallets or you're putting them on um, cement blocks, whatever you're gonna do, you wanna have that ready so that when you get there, you can put your bees on there and then the next day, you're not trying to move them 10 feet to another location. You wanna unload them, you wanna pull your screen off and run like the devil because they're gonna come out after you. <laughs> So and they're not friendly at that they're point. Not, they're not happy. So they're not I, friendly at all. Our favorite is to get them ready the night before and then get up before daybreak and move them. But if you're moving them two hours, you're probably just going to go ahead and move them at night or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. However, like Cecil says, it's cooler this time of year. So if you're moving them on a morning where it's, you know, 40 degrees or 45 degrees, you'd be fine doing it in the morning in the daylight. Um, one mistake a lot of people do make that we hear about is it's really cold out as in like 10 degrees and they're going to move their bees in the middle of the winter and they think that's a really good idea. However, when it's that cold and the bees can't get jarred and fall to the bottom of the hive, then they break that cluster in there. It's too cold for them to climb back up to their honey stores. So that's, um, so don't do that. So, but it, you know. It Jolie, okay. this is Miles. Last time I moved hives, Robert Burns helped me. No. And he did a great, did a this great job. This was way before then. This was I like know. years ago. I understand, I know. But I just want to tell you, he did a great job. And um, just as we were at a, the site to deliver them, pouring rain came in poured. and it just poured on him so so in our chat group somebody asked kind of a related question and they said if we have two groups of hives should they be close together on the land we have two groups far apart so if somebody doesn't like the way their hives are situated and they're not miles apart how would you move them? Oh, and you probably should answer his. Does it make any difference whether they're close together or far apart? Well, we like to leave enough room, but like we'll usually put two together and then make sure we have enough room on the sides so that we can move from the sides. However, research is showing that those horseshoe shapes seem to work a little better that the bees can you know, rather than a straight line, though I will say all ours are in straight lines. But the horseshoe shape seems to work pretty well. If you have bees in a location on your land and you need to move them a few feet or turn them around, that's okay. But if you have to move them 10, 20, 30 feet or across the yard, you ideally you would want to move them away for a couple weeks and then move them back to a new location. Otherwise, when it's that close, they don't realize that they've moved and they keep going back to the old location. So the rule is kind of two feet or two miles. So I don't know that there's any benefit to moving your hives so that they would be grouped closer together, except your convenience and other than that I, I, th there's no benefit to the bees in nature wild colonies would probably not be as close as across the pasture i mean it, it's they would probably be even further um so it the definitive word on that oh here is an opportunity for a little advertisement the definitive word on that would could be heard at our Kansas Honey Producers meeting by um, our guest speaker, Mr. Tom Seeley, who is going to 
taught, he is, he has done more research on, on hive placement than anybody else in hive preference. So you could ask him that. And so our Kansas honey producers meeting is coming up. Jolie's going to talk about that. Hope a little later, just give us a, the word on it. Okay. Well, that was some good information about moving our bees and thinking about that. Here's one that came up on Facebook and I'm not sure they thought they were asking a question, but we had a question about it. And so if you're, you've done your honey harvest, what are the advantages or disadvantages of bottling all your honey harvest at the time of extracting? And I see lots of people doing that and they've got their, all their bears and their quartz and everything all lined up there from their honey harvest. And we've never done that. And but I was kind of wondering about it. Anybody want to talk about that? Nobody? Well, it's, uh, there are some years and some honeys that crystallize really fast and it's a whole lot easier to decrystallize your honey when it's in a bucket or something like that. Whereas if it's, if you've got it in jars, especially plastic jars, it's like really hard to get it all decrystallized. So Steve Messberger, I think you should tell people how to make a hot box. And don't forget to unmute yourself. Okay. Well, I use an old freezer. You can use an old refrigerator, you can use a box, you can do anything. And I use drop lights, except for, I think the last time I, Steve tipped him, so there was a heater that he bought and he uses. Um, incandescent lights are put out a pretty good chunk of heat and, um, but they're, they're hard to find now. They, you can't buy one, you have to find somebody that has them. So, um, you know, I think if you're bottling your honey, and you're bottling all of it, you know, I think it has to do with, do you have a way to warm up a five gallon pail or do you have a way um, to set a heat source underneath your jars fish. to um, the tree. Heat crystallize it? I think, I think yeah. it's just a part of your, um, how, what, what you have, what sources you have. Um, I have a thermostat that I can run my hot box at any temperature I want. So I do all mine in pails. I try to just uh, bottle enough what I think I'm gonna sell. And, uh, but either way, my hot box has shelves in it so that I can put my jars in there if they, if with the heat underneath, that can decrystallize it or I can set pails in and warm them all up and then I put them in my bottling tank and I'm good to go. So um, I think it's more of what equipment you have. I've seen people use, uh, I don't know if you're all familiar with the old steel milk cases. Um, those work great. You could put your bottles in, you could put a heat lamp underneath it. I wouldn't put a heat lamp because it's too hot, but a, a 60 watt bulb, incandescent bulb puts out a lot of heat, put that underneath and, you know, just gotta be careful. Don't put anything in there and catch fire with. Um, so it, it's really simple. I mean, they make heaters with all the thermostats that you want. You can get as elaborate as you want. So um, I hope that helps. I'm not for sure. It, it's hard to explain, but, um, it just needs a little heat and it might take a little while. Five gallon pail takes a little bit longer to de decrystallize. So um, mine are set up, I don't know. My freezers are the old, um, like if you went into the store and you wanted uh, ice cream novelties, ice cream sandwich and stuff, you can slide the door across the top, get it and slide it back. That's what I use, they're old, they, they don't work so. Um, and they have baskets in there, and so I can put the heat underneath. Don't get it too close, don't get it too hot. Whatever you do, it's best to control the temperature with a the thermostat. So, 
That's, um... and, and it's, we found the same thing. Something we have found when we were trying to decrystallize in bottles is that you want to be sure that your bottles aren't overfilled because if you've overfilled a bottle, you will then have a sticky gooey mess because that honey will expand, it will run over the sides and that's just ugly. So don't put a label on a bottle until you're ready to sell it or until you're almost ready to sell it because then you'll ruin the label as well as everything else. The and other thing that I've heard- of And there's a little trick that I've used. If, you, if anybody makes chunk comb honey, um, uh -huh. Um, we bottle it and, and put the comb in and then we freeze it, but it will crystallize. And for some reason this year, it crystallized really quick on me before I could get it in the freezer. So what I do is, and I talked to Chad tonight about it. When I put the, when I put my jars of that in to decrystallize, I lay them on their side. Um, if you stand them up, that comb wants to scrunch up to the top of the lid, but when you lay them on their side, they don't, they seem to just stay natural. And then when they're done, don't overheat because that wax will melt. But, mm -hmm. and then when I put them in the freezer, I also put them on the side. That way that stuff's not scrunching its way up to the top and it just looks better for your product. So you might try that. That's, that's a, a good bit. strategy. Uh, Janice Falk wants to know what temperature you set your hot box at. I don't like to, I don't ever like to go over a hundred degrees. That's, I don't like to get hot. Um, um, I don't like to do any temperature above what would be in the hive. Number two is if you're making cream hunting, we usually run that up a little bit hotter because we want to make sure that we have no crystals in that at all. So in our hot, if we're making cream honey, we usually run it to about 125. And then, and then we make our cream honey with that. Great idea about your chunk honey. That's a, a good technique. Someone else I know uses um, a food dehydrator. It has a thermostat on it. It has a fan on it. And if they're, you're only doing a few bottles at a time, that's not a bad way to yeah. try to liquefy yeah. I just found if it lays down side on its side, it just makes a better looking product than letting it scrunch its way up to the top. Yeah, yeah, that's, that, that's a good strategy. Okay, well, this next question, another uh, area person said we have treated for Varroa with Apivar in strips in early August. It was too hot for any other treatment, and yes, it was. It doesn't seem to have worked at all in some hives. We still have loads of mites. What are our options now? Right now, it is critical mass time. So um, who, would, who would like to talk about their mite loads or mite treatments and honestly i know i've seen several people talking about failed mite treatments and i think a lot of people are are the experts not us the experts are talking about checking your mite loads after your mite treatment being more important than doing your sugar roll alcohol wash before your mite treatments you've got mites treat your bees and then check afterwards to see whether they are were effective or not. So what are the options now? Anybody like to speak to this? This is a tough one. We have another question over here in the chat box until then it says, we just treated without testing for mites. Should I test for mites now? And Brenda, yeah. I, that's, that is my thought is that we're seeing quite a few treatments not be effective at all. Someone this last week was doing, of all things, uh, check mite, which is um, active ingredient kumafos, which is an organophosphate, which really stays in your wax forever and ever, is a non known carcinogen. So not a product that we endorse at all. And then said they didn't have good dro mite drop, that it was terribly ineffective. 
lots of resistance. I think for this time of year, and probably Robert's um, probably a, more of an expert than I am, but we used uh, Apigard this, this year. Um, it seems to be very effective, but I would think this time of year, you're almost down to oxalic acid dribble or, or vapor and because the temperatures are so up and down you we don't i mean we've had really cold now we're going to get 80 degrees 88 degrees on what wednesday yeah um so that would be that would be my two options if if i was to have to treat now so i think you could use formic pro now too I wouldn't put it in on Wednesday when we're supposed no. to get to almost 90. But other than that, I agree. I think you could use Formic Pro or your Mitoweight Quick Strips. Mm -hmm. Both, I think, would be real effective right now. Um, and actually, this was interesting. Um, the Apivar was in one of the youth scholarship hives that had actually had a really high mite load when we did the sugar roll. And um, their other two hives looked really, really, really good. But one of these hives, but this one hive, I mean, it's, it still had enough mites that you could see the mites on the bees. So it just, in some situations, and I guess it would even depend where you got your bees as to whether those bees, that beekeeper that you got them from had used had a resistance, pro you know, their Varroa had a resistance to the Apivar, so, I don't know, but. I've had two or three people ask me, well, how many strips of Apivar do I put in? Well, how long do I have to leave those strips in? Well, can I use XYZ at this temperature? And I hate to say this, and all you other people from Northeast can just jump in on this and say, Becky, you dummy, I can't remember. And it's 45 to 50 days is your length of treatment, yeah. but it's one strip for every five frames of bees. So if your bees are in a single hive, it's two strips. If you're, you have bees and brood in two hive bodies, it's four strips per. I can't remember unless I've treated with it probably this season, this month. I just look it up. I, I and the Honeybee Health Coalition. If you do not have that article, it is the easiest, the best, the most convenient way to compare your treatments. Just so so easy to to look at that. And is this a treatment? Uh, is this treatment appropriate for right now in my hive? And I just think it's the best. And so I encourage everyone to look at that. Okay. So be careful with your treatments and make sure that they're working. So our next question comes from Jay. It says, I gave my hives a Varroa mite treatment on August 2nd. I have six hives, all were full of honey and bees. When I went back to check the hives after two weeks, one of the hive was completely devoid of bees and there was no honey in the frames. The other five hives were fine. I don't attribute it to the Varroa mite treatment as the temperatures were not excessive during that treatment period, nor the treatment harsh. The treatment was an oxalic acid shop towel treatment, which is an experimental treatment, but nonetheless, a lot of people consider it effective, Randy Oliver's research. The other hives were fine. It must have occurred fairly quickly after the treatment because when I examined the hive, wax moths had moved in and ruined many of the frames. I had almost no hive beetles this year, but typically put four traps per hive. I normally check on my hives every week, but because of the treatment, I left them alone for two weeks. I saw no evidence of dead bees inside or outside of the hive. The hive in question is within close proximity, 10 yards, to the other hives. Robert, we haven't heard from you. You got any words on this? Any ideas? I would be suspect that probably that hive already had a problem <clears throat> and it may not have been the mite treatment per se that brought them down. Yeah, it just, yeah. 
I think that's a, a good guess and that maybe it just wasn't identified. Uh, and the hot weather is, I mean, the wax moth love hot temperatures. They just grow quicker and faster and crawl more. So it, it's not a surprise. Um, between the beetles and the hive uh, of a wax moth, one of those two is going to get in there and start messing things up. So I, I, I think it went down before you know, the treatment started or was in the process. I would guess that that is exactly it. I think that probably the treatment has nothing to do with them absconding. I would guess that either they had quite a heavy mite load, something. It's it's hard to say. Second, looking back is always hard. At least it is for me. I always do that. Well, Jay, I'm glad you got five that look good. So, several people have talked about, or we've mentioned briefly, oxalic acid. Uh, Steve Messberger mentioned it. Looking at going into the fall, we always do an oxalic acid treatment in November. But so we'll talk about that again later. But look that up on, again, Honeybee Health Coalition, Randy Oliver's work, look at that oxalic acid for your last fall treatment. Next question comes from Daryl, who is an NEKBA member. And he says, after having a lot of problem with hive beetles, I decided to create an area, an area, an area, area with Yes, I need, he had a picture with this. He said, I need to level out the gravel, but he wants our thoughts. He thinks he should be able to set six hives in his area. It looked like it was probably going to have small gravel, four to six inches thick underneath the hives. It would not extend far beyond the hives, but it, it would extend beyond the hives at least a foot or so on all sides. Anybody have any thoughts with that small hive beetle? Stephen, I really don't have a lot of experience with a lot of small hive beetle. I think it'll just make it I'll easier for the for for larva to larva crawl out and get into the ground. It might. They, what are they supposed to be able to crawl? Something like 10 meters, something like that? I mean. They can crawl a long distance, yeah. A, a long ways and so <laughs> but if they get that far it's too late <laughs> well and you've made that point before bob and i think that's probably the best one is that if the beetles are to the place where you have larva we have bad bad things happening already so whether they crawl out and get away is almost moot at that point they've probably already slimed your hive pretty good and taken care of that. I think we need to take care of them before they ever get to that. But Daryl, your spot looked good. It looked very nice, but I don't know whether it'll help your small hive beetle or not, but it looked good. So this is from Kimbra, also an NEKBA member on Facebook. She says, day before yesterday. Oh, this is a sad story. Day before yesterday, I had a very bad experience at one of my hives. It's at a friend's house. She and I walked out to see the activity. I tipped the top, saw good numbers, set it down, reached down for the block to set on top of the lid and bam, out they came. Got my eye inside my mouth, cheek, head, forehead, chest. I ran away trying to flap them out of my hair, tossing off my shirt 300 feet away, covered with bees. Bees still angry, buzzing around my head. I got to the spigot, stuck my head under. They finally left. I had on a dark purple shirt. I have, my hair is long, brown. Uh, it was loose. She said, stupid, no suit on. I got 12 to 14 stings in my face, head, neck, chest, mouth. And I've been taking Benadryl for two days. She said she's having trouble sleeping because she's waking up and feels like they're crawling on her. Moral of her story, wear a suit. And I think we say all the time, at least a veil, cover, cover your poor head, that sort of thing. But she would like some, I would like for her some suggestions for getting away from angry bees. I think our fight or flight kicks in and we all think I'm going to run. And then they said, put your head under the spigot. And 
if I was a mean person, I might have told Kimber that I would have really kind of liked to have seen this whole thing, but that's mean, so I won't say that. But any suggestions for getting away from mean, angry bees? <laughs> yes, right. Yeah, I think, I think go, Robert, go ahead. Everybody's done that. You know, At oh, least I, one. oh, I forgot to do this, and I'm just going to go back and do that. I think they're in a beekeeper that had done that, and then they wish they had enough. But she got it really bad, so go ahead, Robert. <laughs> Sometimes you have to drop everything and run. And a lot of times stopping at a spigot, I would run into the house to the shower or something yeah. instead of staying outside where you have the potential of getting more, getting more stings. I, you know, I don't know, or getting the car or something. Get, in, get into an enclosure. They won't follow you into the yeah. dark garage. Typically, it's disorienting in a dark space. Get into your shed. Get into the car where you can't have additional numbers attack you because they're just reacting to the pheromone at that point in time. So yeah, yeah that's Great. run like hell. <laughs> yeah, run like I, hell to a dark enclosure. Yes. <laughs> I don't like the water aspect. Just keep running. <laughs> with my long hair when I I not so have I tried this? Yeah I did. The water just seemed like, oh now I've trapped them. So now they're yeah. next to my skull and they're they're just yeah. there. Cheryl is I've right. Seen the movie uh, Forrest it, Gump, right? Run, Forrest, run. <laughs> run, run, Forrest, run. That's exactly it. But a dark, if you can get to a shed, a garage, a dark room, they they usually then, in fact, if you just go in and you leave the door open, they'll move to the light then and get away from you. But uh, the other thing is the difference in bees this time of year compared to in the spring when there's so many resources oh, gotcha. out there. And they're just nasty because they're protecting all their honey because they they know there's not much more coming in. So that's time of year. That vibe that was just couldn't couldn't care less in June. They care now. They care. And so. I also talk about you don't know what's going on at night. You got a skunk messing with them. You know you just don't. You never know what attitude your bees got. Sometimes they just have a bad day. So uh, <laughs> I think eventually you learn that, oh, I forgot something. Oh, I'm gonna put a veil on anyway. I, the other, oh, it's been a month or so ago, I, I mow around my hives and these, and I wear a suit now because one day I was mowing and one hive came out and it didn't like me. and. I jumped off the mower running for the truck. So uh, it, it all happened. So now I just use a suit when I mow. But three end hives, they came out like I thought they were swarming, but they were coming out looking for me on the mower. Three <laughs> hives, I mean, there were thousands. I'm going, oh my gosh. And then I go out and work them the next week. They're fine and dandy, no big problem. So you just never know. They'll let you know real quick. We have a, Brenda's added to our chat and she said, we had a small child with us when we robbed honey and he got stung and one beer bee in his ear was a trip to the ER. The bees are more aggressive if we, oh, are bees more aggressive if we set up far from the house and away from people activity and I'm sorry for the sting in the ear. I've had that and that is so painful, but I don't think they are more aggressive in one location or the other, but I would have other people weigh in on that. I think it has more to do with the time of year, and, but not yeah. the location. There are a lot of factors, family. location with sun or shade, or is it what yeah. time of day? Is it dark, light, what the weather is? There's a lot of variables that we really don't know. But that's an unfortunate incident, and I'm sorry to hear that. Oh, <clears throat> that is so painful so painful. So this is from James, and I don't understand this question, so maybe we can figure out if James, if you're here tonight, speak up, but it says, if I use the oxalic acid drip method in the spring, how do I balance getting it done with early brood buildup and spring cool temperatures? Parentheses, he says, I will be doing both deeps on each hive. So apparently he wants to do a oxalic drip 
and he wants to know, I guess, whether that would affect spring buildup? Well, you know, the Honeybee Health Coalition, they don't suggest using oxalic acid in the spring. Well, no. Not on the buildup phase, they say on the, the decline phase. Yeah, it's probably, it is much better. And if you use, I don't know what you guys think, but if you use that oxalic acid in the fall, this like November, when we're looking for that cleanup, do you find that you need to do an, any kind of an, a mite treatment in early spring? I do, do we have vaporization and okay. I don't find that I need to treat until next year. So I don't treat in the spring. Yeah, no, we don't, we don't either. How about Joe? You haven't winter from you yet today. Joe, Joe Pat, what do you find? You watch your mites. I, um, I, last year I did oxalic acid vaporization uh, in the fall and I plan to do it again uh, this November. Uh, and, but I found that I must not have done a great job because yes, I did have to treat again this spring. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and now I can't remember exactly what I used in the spring. But monitoring, that's good. We have not had much, we do a late fall treatment and don't have much mite issue in the spring at all. So I would say just figure out whether you need to or not. Yeah. You know, look at your bees. But the so trick Joe, is, you did a vaporization in, the, in November or you did a dribble? I did a vaporization. One time? Yes. Like like in the, late in November. Hmm. Well, that was it. I only did it one time. How late? I how probably long? should have done multiples, tested and and done multiples. Is Were there a temperature range for doing vaporization in November? Say again, please. Is that Matthew? Yeah, that's Matthew. Yeah, that was Matthew. Is is it not too cold in November to be doing OA vaporization? You Anything know? above forty degrees. 38, 40 degrees is good. You only need it to be above 40 degrees for a few hours. We do dribble. We don't do vaporization. Uh, well, we have, but we usually choose dribble. And we just, in November, we always have at least a few days where the afternoon temperatures are 40 to 50, and that's when we do it. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Good question. So going on with James, he says, I have two hives that I want uh, to requeen next spring. I requeened two hives this year, one the second week of May, one the second week of June. The latter didn't produce any harvestable honey. They seem to have good store in their deeps now. When should I plan to requeen in the spring? Read your crystal ball. No, that's not nice. So, Cheryl, when are you going to requeen in the spring? Well, is he, is he getting a mated queen? That's a good question. If he's getting a mated queen, I've seen people do it as early as, as late March. I mean, it's all kind of weather dependent. Um, early April. May make a, I mean, requeen or make a split or, but if he's going to actually graft, you've got to have enough drones for your queen to mate with. So that kind of impacts that too. Yes, it does. And honestly, that's exactly the right answer. It, there's so many variables here that, that whatever you're, you really need to evaluate next spring. We've had years where in March, we were already feeling like spring. We've had years where the first week in April, you're going, are we ever going to see spring? So you have to just look at that kind of thing too. Okay, moving on. I have a lot, I have some questions from the Missouri group, but before I jump into those, uh, oh, uh, here's one I wanted to, this is from Jenny in Ohio. Jenny's not here. Jenny says, 
I cut off the wax cappings to extract the honey. I left as much honey, I let as much honey drain off as I thought reasonable. I put the remaining sticky cappings in Tupperware, covered them with vodka, and let them set for about five days. I strained it through cheesecloth and put it in an old wine bottle. It is so good, like the best thing I've ever drank. And she said, um, if you don't soak your wax cappings in your favorite vodka before rendering them, you are missing out. And I want to know who in Kansas knew about this and didn't tell me. So me. <laughs> I'm on two beeswax sites, the beeswax candle making sites, and uh -huh. I thought they were, I'm so stupid, I thought they were using the vodka as a way to clean their beeswax, and I could not understand how that was going to help clean their beeswax. Uh -huh. so apparently, I don't drink enough to know, and finally, yeah. someone put something in that said, well, so if I don't use vodka and I want to use whiskey, was that still taste good? And then I understood what they were using the vodka for. So apparently it's a thing, but I didn't realize what the thing was. So anyway. So has any, anybody tried that? Anybody experimented with this? That, and you, and and because if you'd done this and you hadn't shared that this was awesome, we were done being friends. <laughs> No, that's, that's, I thought that was a cool thing. That's Jenny from Ohio, and uh, maybe things in Ohio have been a little rough in the time of COVID, and this is how she's dealing with them. I'm sorry, that wasn't very nice. Um, let me see. Oh, hang on. I think that's about it. Oh, I have one more thing I want to talk about. My son and daughter-in-law uh, we're traveling this last week. They went clear up into Montana and Wyoming and even into Idaho for a little bit. And as they know, their mom's the beekeeper and dad. They brought home, let's see if we can do this. See if we can see this. They brought me home what I believe is a pound of honey in a tube. It has a little flip lid on the bottom. And this is a very soft squeeze container. And it is Alvarez honeybees, pure and raw honey, big timber, broadest roundup in Montana. And I love the packaging and I think it's innovative and it's new and I think it's fun and I think it would be very appealing. And there is not a contact name and there is not a weight and there is like not lots of things that are supposed to be on this package but it was sitting it's also crystallized and i haven't decided yet whether it's actually been setting long enough it just crystallized naturally or whether it's supposed to be creamed honey i don't know which way it would be but um yeah john brought this home to me to try and i just thought the packaging was pretty cool. It was sitting by the cash register. So it was one of those, yeah, I'll take that home to my mom because she's watching my four dogs at my house. Seven dogs at my house last week. Nutso. Okay, but I got honey. So poor anyway. thing. Is that the Oliveris honey, the same um, Oliveris that do the, the bees in California? I think it is because <laughs> if you see this, well, so this is all backward. Same. This I looks like that is their logo. Yeah, it looks like their logo. Like, they're they're in North California, Montana, and on Hawaii's Big Island. It says. So anyway, I thought that was cool. So anybody else have something for the good of the cause here? I, these the rest are Missouri questions. Yeah, I'm not going through those. So <laughs> those Missouri people are on their own for this one. Okay, here looks like something. Let's see if we can get something else from our. Oh, Janice Falk has a good question here. This is good for this time of year. I have an older deep hive, uh, maybe 10 years old, that the comb is very dark. And what should I do with this? Janice, do you still have bees in this hive now? So this is a, a working hive right at this minute. Is that correct? You can unmute yourself if you want to talk to us. Uh, 
I don't know, Janice. Okay, can you hear me now? I can. Okay, all right. This is, um, it's got honey in it. It has been with bees all this time. Um, but I'm just trying to figure out what to do with it because we tried to extract some of the honey out of there and it was so heavy in the spinner that, and the, and the honey was really dark. So I just wondered what to do with this. We spun out maybe four, four frames, kept trying it, but um, we just, I don't know, we didn't go ahead and finish. It was a 10, 10 frame, um, deep and it was very heavy so i wondered if i should put it on i have one um hive that i'm feeding right now should i put it on with them so they can eat it or what should i do I, and then and in spring um, what should i do with this i need to clean this dark um, comb off too right So yes. I just wondered what to do with it or throw it in the freezer or what should I do? <laughs> Anybody want to feel this? Go ahead. Robert, how about you? You want to try to talk about it? Robert, you're not, you're muted or something. About their so you've got to find some way to rotate those so combs you out of the you can, your system. You so if they're not all occupied um, by the end of winter time, time, you know, start with the outer frames and take take some of those out or take what you can out. Yep. Yep. Um, usually the, have, we have new frames with different sizes now. So you, you probably have to get new mm -hmm. frames all together um, and put in new foundation. Right. Okay. Right. And if they have honey in them that you want the bees to eat, try try to position them right beside the brood area so that they can eat that out. And then early in spring, early, early, when they get empty, you want to remove them then before the uh, bees can start, before your queen starts laying again, because you, you do want those out of your Breeding, breeding program. You want those to be to be moved on. So, okay. So anyway. when the bees aren't on them after they've cleaned the honey out, then rotate those out. Put new ones in. Then. Yeah. You can yes, see, that's what I'd recommend. And John Edmonds. Depends on where your colony ends up in the or something. you know late yeah. winter, early spring. But yeah. if those are ten years old, it's way past time on rotating that comb out of there at this time anyway. So we should all be on a rotation process. Um, when that comb gets to be four or five, mm -hmm. six years old, yeah. um, start taking out 20% a year. That's only two frames and, yeah, and put true. in new, you know, a couple true. new frames what we'll do is we'll go every year. It and when if she... Okay. Okay, thank you. So the thing probably not to do, uh, looks like we have, it says talking about robbing maybe answer this at the end, but we set all frames several steps away from the hives for the bees to clean, and some frames still had honey. Did we do wrong? And if you didn't have robbing started by that, you dodged a bullet. But it is not a practice that we would recommend. Jolie shook her head yes, and so it, if you want those cleaned out, one way that I have had success doing it is put them in a super, put a, your frames that you want clean in a box and put it above the uh, inner cover on a strong hive and they will go up through the Porter Beescape, the hole in the middle of your inner cover and they will then pull that honey back down. They aren't gonna be as likely to put more honey in there. That's at least my experience. Anybody else come on, to try to do that? And I, I know you, you have a little bit of honey. What do you do with it? Well, I try to extract mine out if I have to take it off. But other than that, I do the same thing that Becky would do. But don't leave it on longer than a day because they'll start storing. Sometimes they'll start putting nectar back up in there, but you want them to take it out. 
they'll reorganize it and clean up. That's what I do, put my oh, wet yeah, supers yeah. on, because I like to store yeah, mine no, dry. No, we, we, we do it a different way. We store ours dry, too. That's, hey, Becky, that's, do you I, see this question about um, the person from KU who's managing the top bar hives? He's I did, and I forgot it. So th uh, that would be good. Just ask but, everybody. Yeah, Steve Messberger, is that something? I know at one time you had a few top bar hives. This is from Vaughn Gessley. He said, not a specific topic question, and I know it's not advisable in this area for overwintering, but I might have a few top bar hives donated to the KU Beekeeping Club to manage. And I was wondering if anyone had experience or knew anyone I could talk to about their experience with that. Steve doesn't, you don't exactly do top bar, you do more long uh, length straw. They were horizontal hives. They used the Langstrop foundation in them. Yeah. Um, you know, it, there's a lot more manipulation of those bees than, than probably in a Langstroth. Um, this time of year, you want to push all the bees and brood to the back and you want to put the honey in, in the front towards the entrance so that they all move one direction and not out to the to the side where there's nothing there so um it they work great i mean they're cheap you can build a a horizontal hive for 50 60 bucks um so you know if he's got any questions he's welcome to call on you there's also if you look online the, there's a a pretty active group in the Wichita area that keeps uh, top bar hives or hives of that configuration and so look for them online they're they're very um, loyal to their top bars they they like them a lot and so they will th undoubtedly offer you questions be able to answer I, I don't know anybody that even keeps them yeah, there's different ways to feed them. Um, it's a little tougher in the winter, and there's just all kinds of, it's just a whole different thing than what we're used to. Um, but if you do it right, it's it's fine. Um, um, we did the horizontal hives because I had special needs kids working them, and they were up at that hive, at that the good hive. They didn't have to lift anything. They could pull the frames out very easily, so... That's why we were working with, um, um, we, if you look up horizontal hives, they have them. Um, uh, there's a guy in Missouri that does it. He will he can get the plans for all that stuff. So it's, um just depends, you know, if you, if you don't like lifting heavy boxes, it's a great way to, to do things, so. Sounds good, I appreciate the advice. The, uh, the harvest is a lot for a lot of people. You are going to make either uh, crush and strain to get extract, to get liquid honey, or, you know, make some comb honey. There you go. So there's, there's the people that like them, love them. That would, that would be it. So, well, we are past our eight o'clock mark. Anybody else? Jolie, talk about the KHPA meeting real quick. The, am I, I think I'm unmuted. Um, no, the KHPA meeting is coming up on, we're doing a one day virtual meeting this year. It's on Friday, October 23rd. And it's um, gonna be right in your home. But um, we have some great speakers. We recently added Dr. Tom Seeley from um, Cornell University and he's gonna talk about the honeybee colony as a honey factory. And I think that'll be really good. And then we have Liz Walsh, um, who's up in Canada now. And she's going to be giving us a couple talks. One is on um, just identifying different bee diseases and then talk about um, different ways to treat for varroa and that sort of thing. That'll be really good. And then Tammy Horn Potter is from Kentucky. And one of her talks, she's just recently written a book on. Um, pollinators and plants and one of her talks is going to be on that and then we've um, Dr. Marion Ellis from 
uh, Nebraska is going to talk about producing high quality comb honey. And he's the master. He's just really, really good to listen to. And then the um, 2020 American Honey Princess is going to be talking to us about selling your honey virtually, which um, I don't know about a lot of you, but Cecil and I do an awful lot of um, craft shows and every single solitary one has been canceled. So I'm looking for a way to make money to supplement our social security. So I'm interested in that. Christy has a little video about cleaning beeswax and another one about preparing Ross rounds that she's gonna talk about. And then the different KHPA board members, several of them have um, actually videotaped their extracting system. So um, five or six of them have said they've done that. So I think that'll, that's always really interesting to see how other people do it because that'll give you some different ideas. So it's one day, it's $12. We actually have to pay all the speakers a fee and so the $12 is pretty important, but it's where typically if you go to a meeting, it would be almost $100 a person. This is $12 for however many people you can squeeze in front of your computer. So it's a good deal. So we also have a virtual honey show and the information about that. Uh, they have to be sent to the judge by Friday this week. And so um, you can find that information on the NECBA website or the Kansas Honey Producers website. So, did I forget anything, Becky? Well, we're gonna try KHPA Zoom coming up this next Sunday evening, the 11th, is that correct? We're gonna do a little question and answer with KHPA. So, we there's a lot of people that we've kind of gotten to be Zoom, uh, regulars we kind of do it but the khpa people have not so we're going to do a little question and answer with them the sunday this next sunday and so come and join us the more the merrier it's uh you get the comfortable chairs and you can just tune in so send us your questions too if you, if you didn't get answered tonight and you want we'll be looking for questions for next week on sunday Happy anything birthday. i i i can't think of anything else cheryl or robert or joe or steve anybody If not, thanks for tuning in.